This channel is brought to you by the family of Bill Britton. Written material may be ordered at BillBrittonMinistries.com. All of Bill Britton's messages are sent out for an offering of any size. This is a faith ministry made possible by the members of the body of Christ. We give God all the glory and pray He blesses this message wherever it goes. I approach the book of Revelation much like I did the book of Ezekiel, recognizing that there are truths in there that I'm incapable of really uh, fully understanding and knowing. But I believe there are things that he wants to speak to us about this. And verse 3 tells us, and I'm going to bless you tonight. So it says, Blessed is he that readeth, and they that hear the words of this prophecy. Speaking of the book of Revelation. And keep those things that are written therein, for the time is at hand. There's something a little more urgent than just hearing what's in the book of Revelation. There's a keeping of the book. Hallelujah. We have grown up into a generation that I didn't know too well. I don't remember being so much like that when I was younger. But we've grown up into a generation of people that go through things that are all gung-ho for the things of God. The next thing you know, you're digging them out of a pit. Or they're hollering, leave me alone. I don't want you to dig me out. And... Uh, we're looking for a people who can keep the words of this book. You are vessels, hopefully vessels of honor. For in that every great house there are vessels of honor and vessels of dishonor. Even in the house of God, he has had vessels that he has used that were vessels of dishonor. He used Judas Iscariot. He used Pharaoh to oppress the people of Israel to prepare them for an exodus. They had it so good, Moses would have never got that nation of Israel out of Egypt. Pharaoh had to help him. Oh, you say Pharaoh's not of God. God didn't create Pharaoh. <coughs> Pharaoh just slipped in there and grabbed a hold of that and began to you know, war against God. God did his best to overcome. Now, now you just stop that foolishness. God said, I raised up Pharaoh yeah. to do a work. Yeah. Why? Because his people are stubborn and cannot hear the word of the Lord. And he has to raise a Pharaoh up to get their attention. Hallelujah. And if we didn't have so much stubbornness about us, we wouldn't have so many Pharaohs to deal with. Hallelujah. But God sends along a Pharaoh to deal with something in us. Hallelujah. I well remember some of the vessels of dishonor that God sent my way to uncover and expose spirits that are in me, spirits of self-defense, spirits of retaliation, spirits of anger, and things that were in me that I didn't manifest around my dear friends that were loving and kind and gentle to me. There was no necessity for those things, no occasion for those spirits to be exposed when I'm around people who are always patting me on the back and say, you're a great preacher and I love you and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And, but God, knowing what's down there in seed form and what will grow if given a little watering and a little right conditions, he sent the conditions along so it grow up enough to sprout above the ground and to see there was really a weed and not a tomato. Hallelujah. Not a true fruit of the Spirit, but a weed. And then he let that be exposed because some vessel of dishonor stirred that thing up within me. So the people of God, if they could hear God, 
if they could deal with their own spirit, God wouldn't have to send spirits to, to expose things in them. Let me tell you, uh, I had a, a letter recently from someone who took issue with the idea that God would ever send an evil spirit to do a work for him. And I had to go to the scripture and just point out a few of the many occasions where God sent an evil spirit to trouble Saul, to get Ahab to go up to get killed. He sent strong delusion to those who would not believe the truth. So they would believe a lie. He could not have that kind of people in his kingdom. He had to weed them out. But in order to weed them out, he had to get them to grow. Because it's hard to weed a garden when all the weeds are just seeds. You never weed. I know if any of you ever had a garden, you never went out and weeded the garden and went down there and dug. So, well, I believe there's a seed of a weed down here. I'll get it before he comes up and dig around trying to hunt for a seed of a weed. You don't do that. You have to wait till the weeds come up. I thought I was going to be a gardener because I had two acres of land in Oklahoma one time and I had a nice plot for a garden and just about the time Rachel was born. And so I went out and plowed the ground up, you know, and boy, I'm going to grow a garden. <laughs> Through the winter time, you know, that slot looked nice all during the cold weather. It was uh, all plowed up, you know, looked like it was ready for spring to come where I could plant some seeds and all. So uh, springtime came, and I was home long enough to get out there and stick some beans and peas and corn and various things, succotash. <laughs> yeah, I thought I could plant that, but I found out I couldn't plant that. <laughs> but I got the seeds all, and then I went off on a preaching trip, and after a while I came back. There was my garden, about waist high. And about ankle high was the good fruit. But boy, was it full of weeds. I found out that that good piece of land that I had seen all winter, nice and bare, nothing growing, no weeds exposed to nothing through the winter time, secretly had some seeds I had not planted. I didn't plant those weeds, but it was there all the time. Hallelujah. Now the Holy Spirit, through the... Uh, things that we do through our prayer life, through our reading of the word, through our fellowship with the saints. And believe me, folks, that's very important. You find folks that say, well, I can stay at home. I don't need to go to church. I stay at home and watch the TV and see Oral and see these uh, programs, you know, and uh, Glass Cathedral and, and read the Bible and uh, study, you know, and that. But there's something about the fellowship of the saints that plants a seed within us that grows us into a fully developed man of God or woman of God. And so God, by the Holy Spirit, is planting seeds within us. But there are some seeds already there. And the Bible says in Hebrews uh, 6 that when the rains come, and the sun shines, and all the conditions are right, not only will the good seed grow, but the bad seed grows too. And in times of harvest, in times of revival, if you please, you're going to find the worst things you ever thought exposed in the church. And it'll make you want to run. Well, you know what it makes me want to do? Get ready for the revival. Because the weeds are growing, the conditions are right, and if there has been any seed planted by the Holy Spirit, it's going to grow too. Yes. Amen. Hallelujah. I believe there's been some seed planted. And we are vessels of honor in which he keeps something. 
Keep those things which are written in this book, for the time is at hand. Keep them. We are vessels to keep something. God puts in these vessels of honor. Be a vessel of honor. Don't be a vessel of dishonor. Yes. Hallelujah. Glory to God. You know, sometimes I think that God keeps some vessels of honor, dishonor around. Let's call them garbage cans. I'm talking about people. And I believe there are vessels of dishonor that he keeps around that will help to carry off all the stuff that he does not want in his church. There is a separation coming. There is a purging that's taking place. He's getting ready because the time is at hand. That's verse 3. Now we want to go to verse 4. We didn't get very far in our last lesson. I don't know how many verses or chapters that we're going to finish tonight because I don't want to go too late. But let me just say in verse 4, John to the seven churches which are in Asia. Hallelujah. Now, when he's writing to these churches, it's uh, similar to the situation when there were four evangelists, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, who published the word about the life of the Lord Jesus. Now, that word was being received by many of his followers. That word was being spoken and perhaps written by many of his followers. That word was being received by the multitudes and is for all of us today what is written in those four books. But God just chose those four men to set forth these truths about the gospel of the life of Jesus. Now the same situation here, we have seven churches that God picked that were all situated together in Asia. We call Asia Minor. And there those churches, he takes those particular churches, Philadelphia, Thyatira, Sardis, Ephesus, the others, and Laodicea and so forth, and he takes those seven churches, and from them he begins to draw us a picture of what's going on in the body of Christ. Yes. Hallelujah. Now some historically feel that these seven churches, as we get in chapter 2, we'll deal with that, are a picture of the history of the church from uh, the days of the apostles down to the present day. Others feel that they are prophecy of what's going to be happening in the last day, and we'll deal with that when we get to it. What I'm coming to here is, he says, John, is. I'm writing to the seven churches which are in Asia, grace be unto you and peace from him which is, which was, and which is to come. Now, notice the order in which he puts this. Now, the chronological order of saying such a statement would be, I'm writing to you about him who was, is, and is to come. Jesus Christ the same yesterday, today, and forever. But he says it a little different. He says it like Jesus Christ today, yesterday, and forever. But he puts the emphasis on today. About him which is. Hallelujah. Now, notice in... Verse 1 of this chapter, um, that this whole book is concerning the revelation of Jesus Christ. And what we're going to zero in on, what we're going to emphasize in the study of this book, is we're going to find Jesus in here. We're going to find who he was, what he was, what he uh, uh, came to do, what he did for us, where he is today, we're going to look for Jesus everywhere in the book. Amen. I'm not going to hunt for the Antichrist. If he's there like a weed, he'll probably pop up. But I'm not hunting for him, I'm hunting for Jesus Christ. He's the light, and he'll shed light uh, about us. All right. Hallelujah. Grace be to you from him which is, and was, and is to come. The emphasis here is that he is, and he always is. When Moses was here, 
The important thing to Moses was not that God was a God which created the world. God was a God which was going to come and die on the cross. But to him, the important thing was, God is here. If you don't go with us, we don't want to go anywhere. We want your presence. We want you to go with us. We want the present God. The God that is. Hallelujah. When Daniel went in the lion's den, he wasn't thinking about the God that was with Elijah back there and called fire down from heaven. The good God back there that did wonderful things for uh, Samson and the other prophets. He wasn't thinking about the Christ that's going to come someday and redeem us from sin. He was thinking about the God that's going to save me from these lions. The God that's here in the midst of of this den, or with the other friends of his, the God that went with them into the furnace of fire. He that is, hallelujah, he's a constant presence, and we have him now. Now it's wonderful to talk about what God's done in the past, what he's going to do in the future, but I want to tell you that the thing that is going to bring life to us right now is a God that's with us right now. We have him today. Hallelujah. Somebody said, well, I don't feel anything. I hope that someday he'll come with a revival. Well, someday he's coming with a revival. He is the God that, that shall be. He is and was and is to come. He is the God that is to come. And there will be things in the future. But right now we're talking about him that is. And Jesus Christ is not off on a journey making plans to do something in the future. The plans were all made before the foundation of the world. He is here now. He's working with us today. When John was on the Isle of Patmos, he was caught up in the Spirit, and he walked in the presence of God that is. Hallelujah. Now, Hebrews 13 and 8, I quoted that, that he is yesterday, today, and forever the same. He does not change. In John chapter 1 and verse 11, it says, And he came unto his own, and his own received him not. Jesus Christ was a Savior that is. But he came to a people that was a people that was and is to come. They didn't have any reality for the present. Their lives were not walking in the Spirit. There was, they were full of hypocrisy and sin, full of ambition and greed. They were not living for God in the present. They were living for a God that was be past. They were living for the God of Moses, for the God of Jacob and Abraham. As the woman at the well said to Jesus, when he said, I'll give you a drink, if you knew, you'd ask me for a drink of my water. She said, well, are you greater than our father Jacob who built this well? This is, this is one of Jacob's wells. You're going to have a, uh, you got a well better than Jacob's well. She was living on history. And because of that, she didn't really have much hope for the future. Hallelujah. He said, the one that's got life is here now. Hallelujah. He's the one that's a fountainhead. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Isaiah 61. Isaiah 61, verse 1 and 2. Hallelujah. The Spirit of the Lord God is upon me because the Lord hath anointed me to preach good tidings unto the meek. He hath sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives and the opening of the prison to them that are bound to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord and the day of vengeance of our God, to comfort all that mourn 
One day this man, Jesus, walked into, on the Sabbath day, into the church or the synagogue that he occasioned in the city of Nazareth. He sat down with them, and the service went on, and he had gained the reputation as being a teacher, doing some wonderful things. They'd heard news about things that he'd done someplace else. And so they called on him to read from the word of the Lord. Now I was watching on the video the other night with a tape we had with the grandchildren there and we were watching the story of Jesus. Uh, a video, a movie about Jesus. And I sat there and watched this scene. And they had it pictured in uh, the scenery of the hour. You know, in that primitive, uh, ancient type of buildings and the churches, they didn't have air conditioning and nice pews and all that sit on. And here this young man, barely 30 years of age, hallelujah, gets up and walks to the front. And they hand him the scroll. And he opened the scroll and he looked for the place and he found this verse in Isaiah. And as I looked at that, I began to, the reality of what was happening began to hit me a little stronger once again. Because Saul, so here is a young man looking out over the congregation. Some of these ancients, some of these teachers who had been looking into that word and, and studying that word for longer than he had been alive on earth. And he took that word, began to read to them. And he said, the Spirit of the Lord is upon me. To open the prison doors, to set the captives free. We read this in the fourth chapter of the book of Luke. And he read to a certain place in the middle of a sentence, and he stopped. He read the part that is. And then he came to the place where it says, The day of vengeance of our God, that was which is to come. But he closed the book at the end of the is, and he handed it back to the minister. And he said, This day is this scripture fulfilled in your ears. This day, the Spirit of the Lord God is upon me. Now that rocked their theology. They were a people of the God that was. They were a people of the God that is to come. But suddenly be faced and confronted with the reality that this Messiah that they read about in the past and that they looked for in the future was right here in front of them in this hill village, this country little town in the hill country of Nazareth. They couldn't handle that. Hallelujah. Now it's hard for us to get a picture of what they had to face that day. Even in Springfield, we don't consider this such a hick town. Pentecostal people for years have been considered this is almost heaven. But if you were up here at, say, some little town like Rolla, Lebanon, or Miami, Oklahoma, or Gruntsville, Arkansas, and suddenly... Someone would tell you this is the very center of what God is doing. It's here, right here, right in front of you. That'd be a little hard to handle. Hallelujah. Hard for the organization to handle the idea that God would do something outside of headquarters. When revival came... God began to pour out His Spirit. The 
theology was, the philosophy of the organization was, we're not against God doing great things. We're not even against something new happening. But if God's going to do something new, he'll first bring it to responsible brethren in headquarters and we'll dispense it to the churches. But God didn't do this this way to Israel. He didn't start in Jerusalem with the high priest. I'm always amused, I've read this a number of times, but back in the book of, of uh, Matthew, hallelujah, Matthew chapter, the early chapters, all right, let me find it here. I, I think what I'm looking for must be in Luke. All right. Luke chapter 3. I want you to know where the Word of God came. Where revival broke out after 400 years of not hearing the Word of the Lord. All they had was a scroll. They were a prophetic people. Israel was a people who lived by the word of the prophets. Kings were set in by prophetic words. They were ordained by the prophets. Samuel, others, prophets, prophesied to kings. Israel lived by the word of the Lord. And yet from the days of Malachi, there had been no word. And then it came. And notice where it came. Now in the 15th year of the reign of Tiberius Caesar, boy, that's the big number one guy there, Pontius Pilate being governor of Judea, Herod being tetrarch of Galilee, his brother Philip the tetrarch of Idorea, of the region of Trachonitis, Lysanias the tetrarch of Abilene, Annas and Caiaphas being the high priest. That's seven big boys right there. The word of the Lord came unto John, the son of Zacharias in the wilderness. Didn't come to Rome, didn't come to Jerusalem, didn't come to the, priest, the priesthood. It came to a man that many considered a crackpot, clothed in skins, living in the wilderness, wild and unruly to many, outside of any organized religion, Departed from it. Had been a part of it, but he had departed from it. His father had been right in there as a priest in the temple. But he had been separated. And that's where the word of the Lord came. Hallelujah. Jesus stood up in the midst of the people. And he said, the spirit of the Lord is upon me. Not shall be. Not let's pray for it to come. It is here. Yeah. Hallelujah. Can you believe that tonight? Yeah. Can you believe that tonight? Yeah. And if you've got a sickness in your body, you stand up because the Spirit of the Lord is upon me to heal you. Nobody got sickness. Nobody believed it. Did you hear what I said? You got a sickness? Stand up. Hallelujah. I just remain standing for a moment. Glory to God. The Spirit of the Lord God is upon me because the Lord hath anointed me to preach good tidings to the meek. He hath sent me to bind up the brokenhearted. If you're brokenhearted, stand up now. To proclaim liberty to the captives. If you've got a bondage in your life, if you're captive of a habit or a spirit that you've troubled you, stand up. To proclaim liberty to the captives and the opening of the prison to them that are bound to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord. Hallelujah. Glory to God. 
In the name of Jesus, I want every devil in hell to hear this word. You are defeated. The Son of God has come and defeated you on the cross. Come through that tomb. And tonight, I cast you out of these vessels. These are vessels of honor. And devil, you loose them in the name of Jesus. Loose them. Now, people, be healed. Receive healing. Receive deliverance. The opening of the prison doors. Be free, men. Free women. In the name of Jesus. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Glory to God. He's a God that is. Amen. You may be seated. Now you take that ears home with you. And if you don't get immediate healing and deliverance, I want you to take something, a card or something. They have a little, I have some little yellow slips that have sticky on the back of them. You just paste them up, you know. But put I-S, is. Stick it around your house. But every once in a while you can look at that and say, He is. Amen. I have my deliverance. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Let the sick say, I'm well. Let the weak say, I'm strong. Amen. Hallelujah. Consider those things that are not as they are. Because He's a God that is. Amen. Hallelujah. All you say is there's going to be great revival. Yeah, but that's for those people out there that don't know he is. We're going to reach them with the God that is to come. The God that is to come is going to come to them. But we're not a people that don't know him. Know him as the God that is. Hallelujah. Be today what he is. Oh, let me read something to you that's pretty strong here, but I'm going to read it anyhow. If I can find it. In 1 John, glory to God. 1 John chapter 4 and verse 17. Herein is our love made perfect that we may have boldness in the day of judgment. Because, here's why we can be bold. Okay? Because, as He is, so are we in this world. As He is. How is He? That's what we're going to find out, reading the book of Revelation. Amen. The book of Revelation is the revelation of Jesus Christ. Yeah. And as he is, so are we. Can you stand on that? Yes. Hallelujah. Write it down. Put it up on your wall. Is. He is. I is. Glory to God. As he is, so is I. I is. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. All right, back to Revelation. Glory to God. From him that is, the God that is today. Next it says, the God that was. You know, as we said, in every situation in life, in every place, whether you're living in Moses' day and Paul's day or today. He is. He is the same. Then, he is today, he is yesterday, he is tomorrow, he is in the New Testament days, he is in the Old Testament days, he is. But he also was. And he was, no matter what time you pick out, 
He was. He was a God that was. When the Israelites wandered around on the earth, and even before that, when Abraham just had the promise and went through the land, walking through the country, Brother, God had already been here. God had already done some things. God had already created this earth. God had already set up a plan. He was. He was a Savior crucified from the foundation of the earth. He was a Lord that didn't, didn't set up an alternative plan when Adam fell and said, well, hmm, hmm, I guess we uh, blew it here. We thought we had a good thing going. This man Adam looked so beautiful and he was so wise and we breathed into him the breath of life and now look at him. He's made a mess of it. He's come down into judgment, death. What are we going to do now? Well, the planning committee got together and said, uh, First thing is, we've got to redeem him. How are we going to do that? Well, i got news for you. That wasn't the way it happened. Right. He planned this before Adam fell. Right. He planned this before he put the world together. Before he spoke this earth into existence. He made the plans, and the Savior was a lamb slain from the foundation of the world. Right. Yeah. He was. It was all set up before anybody knew anything. And when they was here, wherever they were, he was a God that is with them, but he was also a God that was. Hallelujah. When Peter, James, and John was here, they could look back and say, God was with Moses. He went through some heavy times. And look how God stood by him at the Red Sea. Look how God opened up the earth and swallowed up his enemies. Look how God did such great things for him. Look at the, how God worked with uh, Israel back there when they needed deliverance. He sent Jephthah, Samson, Gideon with 300 men. Look what God did. He was a God that was. He was a God you could look back and saw he never had a failure. He was a God you could look in the past and say, we can depend on him today because he's reliable. Look what he's done in the past. And I want to tell you, you want to bear that in mind. I get, now hold on, fasten your seatbelts, some of you folks. But I get a little sick at my stomach sometimes, some people throwing up at old time Pentecost saying you people were just full of legalism because you dressed that way and you walked with God so close and you had your mind on the Lord all the time and uh, you know when you got saved all your habits went out the window that night before you got up from the altar hallelujah I mean brother it was a habitual thing it was a Normal thing, when the guy come up in the altar and, and people come and got saved, you can find packs of cigarettes laying all over the altar. Right. And I get a little sick of people telling me that's old Pentecostal legalism. I want to tell you something. God was back there with those people. They did things because they had the life of God in them. Yeah, they were taught that this is the thing to do, but they did it because there was a life in them that brought a new kind of a life to them, that made a new creation out of them. And when they found the Lord, brother, the man come home from church one night when he'd gotten saved, He'd been a man that had kicked the dog around, beat his children, abused his wife, loud and abusive and profane. 
And when he, they hear him approaching, the dog run under the house. The kids would hide in the room. Mom would get busy washing dishes or something. Nervous, shaking. Now, thankfully, I hope you've never had that experience, ladies, to have a man like that. But they were plentiful. And the man got saved and came home. And the family didn't know about this. And when he was walking down the path towards the house, the dog ran under the porch, peeked out something different about him. Kind of timidly come out from under the porch, wagging his tail, creeping up there. The man's whistling, praising the Lord, you know. Pat him on the head. Boy, the kid's peeking out the window. Something different about him. Now that's what happened when God came into a life. Yes. That's what was. And that's what should be is. Yes. Today. That's what we should expect when a, a young person or old person, whoever it is, comes to the altar and gets saved. We should expect a changed life. We should not expect to take six years to dig them out of the pit right. and to clean them up. The blood of Jesus does a good job. Amen. I know it because I know the God there was. I know what the Savior did. Hallelujah. I know what he did on the road to Damascus. Yeah. That's a long way it was. I know what he did for people back there in history. I know what he did for people in my lifetime. He's a God that was. He's a God that knows how. He's left a history. Now this is what Jesus is. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. And whether you go to pre-Genesis or pre-Bethlehem or pre-Charismatic, you're going to find where you found God. And he has not changed. And if we have the God today that Saul found on the road to Damascus, we're going to find He's going to change our lives. He's going to take out the old desires. going to take out the old spirits. Demons won't be able to live with him in there. Amen. Hallelujah. I get a little tired. I'm getting out on kind of a little shaky ground now, you know, I'd say, but I get a little tired of casting demons out of Christians. I know sometimes you have to. I'm not one of those that believes that a Christian cannot have a demon. If I believed that, I'd have to eliminate a lot of people from being Christians. <laughs> I'm not able to do that. But I think that if we get a hold of the God that was and make Him the God that is and walk in the Spirit, we can get busy casting the demons out of the lost and bring a testimony of Christ to the world. Yes, amen. Hallelujah. Instead of the testimony of the world looking at Christ uh, in the church and finding the church people there in more need than they are. Oh, boy. John chapter 17. The prayer of Jesus. And um, John 17 and verse 4 and 5. Just let me read that. I don't think I'll say a lot about that. But Jesus said, I have glorified thee on the earth. I have finished the work which thou gavest me to do. It was his earthly ministry here. And now, Father, glorify thou me with thine own self, with the glory which I had with thee before the world was. This is the was God. Hallelujah. 
There was a time element out of eternity. Eternity is something that never started and never ends. But God picked out a little time element here of 33 years. During this time, he came to earth, stripped himself, came down to earth like any other man, limited in many ways, except that he did not take upon himself the image of Adam. He took upon himself the image of him who birthed him, which is the Lord from heaven. Hallelujah. And he was a life-giving spirit. But during that 33 years, he had something that he didn't have before he came to earth. That was a body. Scripture says in the Old Testament and New, it says, a body hast thou prepared for me. And Mary gave him that body. Mary was used at Bethlehem. And before this, prepare a body for him. He didn't have that body a physical human body. He could manifest himself in any way he wanted to, in a fire. He could appear in a rock. He was a rock that followed him through the wilderness, poured out water to them. He appeared in angelic form to him. He was the angel of the Lord. He could take on a form that looked like a human, come along and sit down with Abraham and eat a steak with him on the, road, on the way to Sodom. But he didn't have a human body until Bethlehem. So God gave him something. He took upon himself something he did not have and he turned it past. But when he come down at the end of this time and was ready to go back, he said, now Father, I want something back I had with you before the world was I don't have now. For during this time when he had your human body, there was something he didn't have and that was glorify me with thine own self. And so the glory of deity. God's own self he had back here. So he came forth out of the grave and ascended up to heaven and was glorified. What does that mean to be glorified? To take on the glory of God's own self. His prayer was answered when he was glorified. When he was glorified, he went back up. He received that glory again in eternity, which will never cease. Never have to be repeated. They will come down and die for sin again. But something else happened. He didn't lose the body. For he said it pleased God that that holy one should not see corruption. He didn't let that body go back to the dust. He brought it out of the tomb. Witness to many witnesses. Feel the nail prints. Feel the wound in my side. It's really me. It's not a ghost. And that body entered back into that realm of glory with him as a testimony and a witness for us that our bodies are going to be resurrected and come into that glory that he has come into. He's a God that was, God that is, a God that shall be, is to come. All right. Now, hallelujah. All right. I want to just put something here. Jesus Christ was a new man. All right. He was a bright morning star. I'll just put bright star down here. He was the head over all things to the church. He was the seed, the divine seed that was planted. Said so himself. He was a cornerstone of the temple. He was the fountainhead. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Or a great river of life. Glory to God. That's what he is to us. Praise the Lord. Now. He still is something here on the earth. 
I mean, you know that Jesus went to heaven. And he remains in heaven until the time of the restoration of all things spoken of the prophets. So, he's in heaven. He's remaining at this present time in heaven. But he is here on the earth. And another form. He is here. He was a new man. And from that new man came a new creation. Every man that's in Christ is a new creation. Old things have passed away. And behold, all things are new or become new. He is a star. And he has called the stars by name, stars of God. The Bible says, They to win many to righteousness shall shine as stars. Hallelujah. All right. He's the head of the church. And we, not somewhere in the future, but today, we are the body. All right. He is the seed. And we are the harvest. We haven't been reaped yet, but that does not keep us from today being the harvest. We are the is today of what he did in the past. What he was to them, we are the fulfillment of that today in him. He was a cornerstone, and we are his temple. Know ye not? The Bible says that you are the temple of the living God. He is the fountainhead, and you're the river of life, the river of God. In that city of God, there is a river that flows. Hallelujah. All right. Hallelujah. So, Father, glorify me. What I had in eternity, amen. I want it back now. Praise God. He is to come. I want to finish this and I'll close with this one. All right? He is. He was. But that's not all. Something ahead of us. We're not going to live forever, all of eternity, bringing forth more children, dying, letting them carry on the load for another generation, then passing it on to another generation and keep on going, trying to survive in this world, trying to build churches, trying to keep from going into apostasy, you know, trying to keep the works alive in a, in a world that's getting worse and worse and more and more humanistic and uh, lascivious and violent and, and vile and unholy. Now, it's not always going to con uh, continue like that. There's something that is to come. And it's all been prophesied in the scriptures. Now, obviously, I can't deal with everything that is to come. And that's not my purpose. What we're looking for here is Jesus. He that is, he that was, he that is to come. So it's him that I'm looking for that is to come. And how is he coming? He's coming as a king. Hallelujah. And we're looking for him to come to uh, what he will do when he comes and what he will become to us. He is the king of kings, the Lord of lords the overcomer that sits on the throne and rules over this world. He that is to come is coming in a day of restoration to this earth. Now, the, the Scripture says in Acts 3 that he remains in heaven until the times of the restoration of all things, reconciliation, I think King James says, of all things spoken of the prophets. But he comes in the times of this. He didn't say he waits until it's all over and restored and set up and, you know, everything is cool. And then he comes to take his place. Nor, on the other hand, it does not say that he's coming before these things happen so that he can get it all set up. He's coming during this time. There is a restoration going on right now. And it's during this time of restoration that he is coming. That makes his coming very near. That makes it very imminent to us of his appearing. Hallelujah. I want to be ready. Glory to God. Ephesians 3, beginning verse 8, unto me who am less than the least of all saints, is this grace given that I should preach among the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ to make all men see 
What is the fellowship of the mystery? Which man hid from... Which from the beginning of the world hath been hid in God, who created all things but Jesus Christ, to the intent, or for this purpose. This is the purpose why he created all things in Jesus, to the intent that now, under principalities and powers in heavenly places, might be known by the church the manifold wisdom of God, according to the eternal purpose which he purposed in Christ Jesus, our Lord. Now, there was an eternal purpose, which he purposed back there, which he said that now, the purpose of God creating the whole world was that now, under principalities and powers, might be known by the church the manifold wisdom of God. And I believe we're going to have to get a hold of the God that is and make that king come to pass now. Yes. Hallelujah. And to the extent that we're willing to walk in the now of the God that is, I believe he's going to empower our words and our actions to change the religious situation here in Springfield, Missouri. But I believe this whole religious philosophy, the whole religious system, the whole religious order is going to change because if somebody got a hold of the God that is, to the intent that now, under principalities and powers in heavenly places, might be known by the church the manifold wisdom of God. Back in 1962, in the spring of 62, and I received a prophecy from C.L. Moore. And one night God got him up to write to me. I'm living in Oklahoma and Louisiana. He began to, the first thing he began to say is, is, I have planted you. Okay, now I can say this at home, see. But I've, pr I've printed the prophecy, so it's common knowledge. If anybody wants to read the books, Prophet on Wheels, I think I did. Said, I have planted you at the foot, at the feet of one of the daughters of the harlot. And I've put in your hands the power to bring that thing down and destroy that thing. I thought, now God, you know, that's an enthusiastic prophet. But that's an awful big order. Hallelujah. And uh, one of the brothers, now gone on to be the Lord, that was a little bit tentative about... Uh, offensive language, who was with me here in the ministry in the early days of this church, said to me, he said, Brother Bill, don't print that. And as long as he was alive, I didn't. And out of honor and courtesy to him, I didn't print it. Because that was offensive in a way, if the organization get a hold of that, he didn't want to be on the side of being so offensive, you know, as that. Well, I'm not quite so delicate myself or tactful, I say. My, my tact and my uh, diplomacy is usually manifested with a sledgehammer. Or, as the Lord spoke to me in prophecy one time, a battering ram. <laughs> but I am beginning to, beginning to ask God to help me to believe that we, a little insignificant, unknown, obscure people out here on the side of the highway can change the area in which we live. Until we see revival. Now it doesn't always have to, it doesn't have to have our name on it. The revival that breaks out doesn't have to say, well this originated with the house of prayer. But I want to see this city break out with revival and bust down the walls of organized religion until men can hug each other regardless of the background they've had and the system they've been in. They can accept one another as brothers and souls can be saved and people can fill with the Holy Ghost and lives can be changed. I want to see this and I'm beginning to believe if we'll get a hold of the God that He is, we can do it. Hallelujah. Now, I'm only saying that because I'm full of faith tonight. 
<laughs> Pray for me tomorrow. <laughs> but the Word does something to you. When I begin to look in the Word, I see that God says, if you will believe this, you can rise up in the Spirit and you can walk with the God that is. Amen. You don't have to hope for the God that will be. You don't have to think about and meditate on the God that was. Oh, He was. Oh, He is to come. But brother, He is. Hallelujah. And the God that is to come this Jesus that is to come is going to come as one that's going to rule and reign over these nations and break them in pieces with a rod of iron like a potter's vessel. Oh, they think they got a vessel. It's a potter's vessel made out of clay, not made out of gold. It's man-made. And he said, you'll break those potter's vessels like a, with a rod of iron. Hallelujah. The nations. That's a God that is to come. We've got a great history ahead of us. Amen. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. One thing I want to say about this scripture in Ephesians 3. The manifold wisdom of God. Now, Dick Mills, I uh, don't know if any of you know him. How many of you know who I'm talking about, Dick Mills on the West Coast? Well, he's a very dear friend of mine. We were together down in Dallas in a meeting, having lunch. And at the table with a, probably about a dozen people, he begins to go around the table and giving them scriptures. You know, he does this. He gives you prophetic words by quoting scriptures, and uh, it's amazing how these scriptures will fit into your situation and your need. So the scripture he gave me was Ephesians 3, and uh, 10, I guess it was, about the manifold wisdom of God. He said, Brother Bill, he said, this is like Joseph's coat of many colors. God's going to give you a ministry. The manifold wisdom of God means the many facets of God's truths are going to come together in one garment. Joseph's coat was a coat of many colors and all those different colors came together in the one coat which was a coat of priesthood. And all the different facets like the, the facet of a diamond you look and see the different aspects of it. He said God's going to give you truths that's going to come together and it'll be a manifold view of the purposes of God. Not just one alley you'll travel up all the time, but the manifold wisdom of God. Hallelujah. And I believe that. And I believe that's what we're going to find in the book of Revelation. Hallelujah. We look for the Christ of Revelation. Yes. Praise the Lord. All right. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I thank you, Lord, You've done such a mighty work in our lives. Glory to God. And sometimes we don't recognize how far you've brought us until we looked at where we were when you found us. And when we can look back and see where we were, where we come from, the rock from which we've been hewn, then, Lord, we see you've done a mighty work in our lives, and you're going to continue it until that day of the Lord when you manifest us as your own. I thank you, Lord, for this book and for the Christ of this book, the Christ that is and that was and that is to come. Help us to understand him, to know him. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you for listening. We pray you were blessed by this message. For written materials or to leave an offering, please visit BillBrittonMinistries.com.